Let's go ahead and read the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about love. You know, the most incredible definition that has ever been penned by any human being on the planet, hands down, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is the most amazing definition of love you'll ever find. I mean, there's been stories written, there's been illustrations given, but there's no better definition and explanation of what love is found in, in 1 Corinthians 13. What is love anyhow? What does love really mean? How do you know love? And the Bible talks so clearly about it and says the following. 1 Corinthians 13. And I hope today, as we exit here today and go all about our business, that we remember that love is the most important element that you and I can cultivate in our lives. It's the most important element in our lives. And since it's the most important characteristic in our lives, we need to invest in love and how to actualize it in our life. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, and I'll go ahead and read it to you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in the iniquity, but rejoices in truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now, let's just stop there for one second. How many of you would like to never fail? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice if you never failed at anything? Do you realize, according to the Bible, if you learn to love God's way, you really never fail? Because love never fails. Love never fails. But whether they are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, glossia, speaking in tongues and having the ability to, to interpret, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So he's basically saying, listen, we're on this planet. God gives us spiritual gifts, which we're going to be getting into later on in the year. But we do it in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall be known just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, the Apostle Paul says something right here is amazing. He says, verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. And if you really want to grow up according to the kingdom of heaven, it's learning how to love well. Learning how to love well is the most important thing that you and I can do. I've seen, I, I've, I've grown up in the Presbyterian church where academia was really important. In order to be a pastor, you have to have the PhD or doctor of ministry. I, I've been in charismatic churches. I've been in Pente, Pente, Pentecost. I mean, I've been in the places where literally they were almost singing, uh, swinging from the chandeliers. They were barking. They were doing, I mean, I've seen it all. I've been in weird, I've been, I've been in all kinds of churches. But I can tell you right now that no matter how smart you are, no matter how many spiritual gifts you are, I don't care if you're an evangelist or whatever you do, if you don't have love, according to the Scriptures, you have nothing. In fact, the Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. 
And if you remember from the very, very beginning in the Garden of Eden, what was the thing that, that the temptation of what? The knowledge of good and evil. And what happened is you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. But do you realize that knowledge apart from love is dangerous? Knowledge apart from love is dangerous. You see, in Scripture, knowledge in love equals truth. Knowledge in love equals truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. This is what really scares me about what's going on in our society today, the amount of knowledge that we're gaining. We're knowing we have basically mapped all the genes, and now they're beginning to, uh, they can clone a sheep, and there's all kinds of talk of things they will be able to do. When we have all this technology without love, it's a scary thing. You think about it. The ability to split an atom, nuclear power, what do we do with it? We made weapons. Without love, it can be very, very dangerous. So knowledge without love is dangerous. Knowledge with love is called truth. And my friends, many of us, and, and for those of you that are married or have children or, or, or you're in a business or whatever, when you try to correct someone or bring correction on someone and you don't have love, do you realize that your correction can be damaging? Because it's not done in love. Love is the most important thing that you and I can learn to do. Jesus, basically, his definition he is the essence of what love is. And if you and I want to know what true love is, we have to know who Christ is. For he is true love. And so, really, it's very interesting how we've grown up and we see these movies and we read these romance novels. I don't read romance novels. They're sappy. Fabio. Oh, I'm sorry. Fabio. Now he's Flabio. Okay. Probably has hair extensions by now. But anyhow, <laughs> Rogaine. I, I'm jealous because he has nice hair. Okay. But we, we hear about love all the time. What, what, love, 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 love. And, and for those of you that are in a dating relationship, if, if, if your uh, boyfriend or girlfriend says, well, if you really love me, you'll do this. That is manipulation. Real love does not manipulate. Real love cares about the other person above you. I was reading just an amazing story the other day. And uh, there's a gentleman back in 2007. He was uh, on the New York City subway system. And he had his two daughters with him. And a man had an epileptic seizure and fell in the number one track between the two tracks. This man, without even thinking, jumped on the tracks Grabbed the guy up. The guy fell again. He got him between the tracks. Number one train was coming. And so he got on top of the guy, and he pressed him to the middle of the tracks. And the number one train went over them by five cars, and he saved his life. I, I don't know about you. I, I, I don't think I could do that. I, I don't think that if my two kids were on the platform, I would jump onto the track and protect someone. But he was a military person. He was, a, he was actually in the military. And he learned to lay down his life for somebody else. Can you imagine doing something like that? Isn't that amazing? You know, I think that, um, you know, Dave Budd has a son. Dave Budd comes to our church, and his son uh, went, to, went to Iraq. And as a result, he's an amputee today. That's a definition of love, putting others before yourself. Uh, we had an opportunity to go on vacation, went to Orlando. My parents were there as well. It was a wonderful time. Went to see my Uncle Al, who's now 91. My, my, Matthew calls him Uncle Al, like an owl. But he's Uncle Al. And he fought in World War II has a purple heart, and he's got medals. He met Dwight Eisenhower, and he talks about how his whole, everyone was, was killed, and he was sitting there in a foxhole, and he had to protect the hill, and how he got up, and how he shot all these Germans, and, and how he, and he was a hero, and how he protected the one that was wounded next to him, and was willing, to, that was an act of love. You know, it's, it's amazing. We, you know, I haven't grown up in a difficult time like that. Some of you have grown up in a difficult times. But love is laying down your life for somebody else, not thinking of yourself. I, I was just reading uh, not too long ago uh, about Jennifer Lopez, if you've ever heard of her. She has a, um, she's got an all tell-all new book. I didn't read it, but I read about it. I've got better things to do with my life. But she's been over three different marriages and the first two each lasted less than a year, while the third marriage lasted about seven years. To her credit, 
she writes about the length. It was about naive, emotional-based. She said this. She said, all my marriages, they all had a passionate intensity that I mistook every time for my happily ever after. Reality is hard to see through, an adrenaline rush of a new love. It's easy to project your hopes and dreams onto relationship when it's new and exciting. I was lucky or unlucky, she says, enough to be with men who were really intense about their feelings for me. They did crazy things. I mean, crazy things like buying me a Bentley, throwing me giant parties, or flying me on a jet someplace. And I loved it. It was intoxicating when it was happening. When a man does something like that, it's easy to think, wow, look how much he loves me. But passion is a pendulum that swings both ways. As beautiful as it can be, it also can get very intense. How can you turn your back on a love so big, so amazing, so real? The problem is, it wasn't love. It was passion. I just didn't know the difference yet. There are many people that are rushing after passion, and they think it's love. That in love feeling, that, that adrenaline rush when you see a butterfly, the orchestra that plays in your, in your abdomen. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You know, I remember getting that first sick feeling in kindergarten. I know. I mean, I, and holding hands with this girl in the planetarium. And giving her a kiss. I was bad. This is kindergarten. I remember my heart. I mean, here I am in kindergarten with a young lady. But I remember, you know, that sappy, that, that love feeling. And many people think that's what love is. That's a little innocent thing. But many people run and, wow, this person makes me feel this way. And now that you're married and it's becoming boring, it's like living with a roommate in college. You're like, this is lame. And you just kind of wake up and you're like, how, how you doing? Good. Your breath smells. You know, whatever. And, and, and you go on about your business and then you go to the office and then somebody comes by. Whoa, what was that? At the coffee machine, you see somebody, or at the bubbler, whatever you were at, and also, wow, that person, wow. I lost that love and feeling, and I have it with you. And all of a sudden, you, you feel the emotions coming up, and you're like, well, I must have missed God. This must be the person. And the, what happens is we think passion is love. That's not love. In fact, you can be in love. And you can be fooled by passion. Just because you have an emotional experience when you see someone does not necessarily mean that you missed it. You see, love is not a, a feeling. Love is a decision. Love is a character trait that is found in God and in Jesus Christ. And you and I need to be a people that are full of character. Now, and for young people that are still uh, single or, or, or wherever you are, if you think it's all about the orchestra feeling and all about the butterflies, listen, that's all a part of the characteristics of what you can experience in love. But that's not what love is. We're going to look at love in a few moments and what it really means. But so many of us are like these Hollywood couples that we, that we really, we, we kind of worship them. We look at them at the magazine stands, and we talk about them, and we read about them. We follow their lives. It's sad. It's really sad. And, 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 and we look at movies. We listen to music. And, all. hey, i got to be happy. And, and we even think that the American dream is the epitome of what God calls us to be. It's what? The pursuit of happiness. And, and unless I'm in love and have that in love feeling, I can't be happy. And since I'm not happy anymore, I must find somebody or something to make me happy. Because that's the most important thing in the world is that I am happy. I have news for you. It's not the most important thing. Most important thing next to knowing Jesus Christ is to be holy. And to be holy is to have wholeness in you. You see, and, and you're running after all these things. And I really want to encourage those of you that are, are not in a relationship or really praying, God, would you just please send someone? Don't let passion rule you. Let love rule you. Well, what is love? What is love? Well, let's look at a couple definitions of love. There's basically four different loves in the Greek language, and this is what the New Testament is written in. And in the Hebrew, there's basically one word for love. In the English language, we call it love. It, it, you know, it's confusing. There's all these, and the Greeks are really good about dissecting, and that's where we get our Western mindset of order. And there's basically four different words for uh, Greek uh, for love. The first one that we can really attest to is called eros, where we get the word erotic. And that includes passion, 
infatuation as well as sexual romance and love. And this is something that our society really likes to talk about, this eros, which is called erotic love. And there's nothing wrong with it within the context of marriage. It is a beautiful and wonderful thing that should be cultivated and else helps to flesh out what love really is. And so that's what eros is one part, okay? Another way is storge, which refers to the natural affection between a parent and child. That's the feeling you get when you hold a baby and, oh, this is my child. And, you know, and you say you love that child and you just want to kiss them. You can't, you know, when it's like you have a little baby, you just, you don't know what to do with yourself. That's so cute, right? Should we have another one? Okay. Look how fast she said no. And then we have the third type of love is phileo, which comes from the word of Philadelphia, which becomes the word of uh, brotherly love. And that's the kind of love you have for a comrade. That's like a, uh, two guys in a foxhole that are in war, and they have a love for each other, are willing to lay down their lives for each other. There's this camaraderie that they have. And that's a kind of a love of friendship. And I would say many of us in this church understand what that is. In fact, when Jesus was asking Peter at the end of the book of the last chapter of John, he, Peter said, uh, Jesus said to Peter, um, Peter, do you agape me? He goes, Lord, you know I phileo you. So basically he's saying, you know I love you like a brother. And he kept asking that question. Then he changed it to phileo. And so that's, that's intimacy between good friends. Now, all of these, eros, storge, and phileo, all of these have conditions to be met in order to have them. It's natural when you have a child. It's natural when you have a child to care about that child and, and protect that child. It's something that God has put in us. It's natural to feel the erotic love. It's natural to have a, a phileo love where you feel like this, this person's my comrade. But there is a mutual benefit going on in a relationship. There, there's some sort of benefit. There's a friendship. You help me, I help you. I look out for you, look out for me. I feel, I feel accepted. And, and listen, there is an innate need that you and I have to be connected to God and be connected to each other. We're not made to be islands by ourselves. It's something that God has created in us. There's nothing wrong with it. But then we come to a different type of love. You might have heard of it. It's called agape. And agape love is very rarely used in the Greek language in different uh, literature from different people. And even in the Bible, it's not used too much. But when it talks about the agape love of God, it is a self-sacrificing love that does not think of itself at all. There are no conditions attached to it. It's I'm going to love you despite yourself. I'm going to love you no matter what. I was reading a story of, um, of a man by the name of, he was a priest. And uh, what happened was, his, uh, he had a, before he was a priest, his, his, his name is Thomas, and his father, Thomas Sr., they had a child that was Down syndrome. And what happened was, um, the little child was in the backyard, and somehow the septic tank gave way, and the child fell about, about five to six feet in the septic tank. The father didn't know what to do, and they tried to grab him. Where is he? He's in the septic tank. So the father dove into the septic tank, and he, 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 he held his breath, and he put this child on his, on his shoulders and held the child up. But he couldn't get up because the child kept pushing him down. He kept holding the child, and they got the child out, and the father lost his life to save a Down syndrome child. And, and the, this man, Thomas, as a result, became a priest and is a really big advocate for coming against abortion and things of that nature because he knows the value of life. That's the, kind of er that's the kind of agape love where you think about somebody else above yourself. You know, one of the things that absolutely amazes me, we've been reading through the Bible if you've been doing that with us, in Exodus, there comes a point in time where the uh, Israelites just turn their back on God and they make a golden calf. You might have seen it. Uh, it's, a, it's a humorous story, by the way. It's sad, but it's also humorous. If you read it, one of my favorite lines in it is uh, Aaron goes, yeah, I just threw some gold in it, and out came the golden calf. And he made all these excuses to Moses. But God says to Moses, I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to start over again. And Moses says something. And I, listen, I, as much as I love everyone here, I don't think I could do this. This is what Moses says. He says, God, if you have to blot me out of your book, save these people. Now, I'm okay with dying for somebody. But to blot me out of God's book would basically mean I'm not going to be with God forever and ever. Moses was willing, and he asked God, I'm willing to blot my name out of your book to save these people. 
That's an agape love, folks. And I, I don't, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I have to that. I mean, I'll take, I'll die for somebody, but I'm not going to give up my eternal salvation. Can you imagine that kind of love? That's an amazing kind of love. That's an agape type of love. And what this world needs today is a radical dose of agape love. And that only really comes for people who are of Jesus Christ, really. And Jesus gave us a commandment. He said this, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. He looked in, and also in John chapter 13, if you want to turn there. John 13, verses 34. This is part of Jesus' last, he's getting ready for going to the cross. This is what he says in 31. So when they go out, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. He goes on. He says, um, verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little longer. You will see me, and as he said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot go. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love, this agape love for one another. And then Peter goes to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said, Lord, uh, why can I not gallow you right now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And he was as genuine as he could be. Jesus answered, yes, you will lay down your life for me. Most assuredly to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And, and he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, I prayed for you after this. But what is the basic, the new commandment I give that you love one another? What does that mean? Well, what, we talked about what it meant. Didn't we talk about what it meant in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? If you ask yourself, in a marriage, in a relationship, are you thinking of others beyond yourself? So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Let's just look at some of the characteristics here that is absolutely amazing. And we have to just realize that love is not just a feeling. It's more than a feeling. One of my favorite Boston songs. More than a feeling. It really is more than a love of feeling. It, 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 says, it says the following. It says, love suffers long. It is kind. It does not envy. does not parade itself. does not behave rudely. does not seek its own. does not provoke. thinks no evil. does not rejoice in iniquity. Bears all things. I mean, what an amazing thing. That this is not about me, God. This is about that other person. But this is what I have awful, also found. There's been times I've asked God, would you make me a better husband, God? And if I try to be a better husband or I try to be a better pastor, say, I want to love the people more at Cornerstone. If I try to love you more without loving God more first, it doesn't work. This is what I have found. When I love God, I love people more. That's the answer. If you're struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling in a relationship with your children, if you're struggling in a relationship at, at home or at work, and you're having, or you have a boss that is just unbelievable, I mean, drive you crazy. Or you have employees that drive you crazy. You know the answer? We talked about it. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Husbands, the best thing you can do to love your wife well is to love God well. Wives, you want to love your husbands and kids well? Love God first. Listen, I'm going to continue to talk about this until Christ comes back. I'm going to go say it again. I'm going to tell you, it's the most important thing. I shared it before I went away. I said, listen, every single day you have to get before God. Every day, make it a priority to give God the best part of your day. Every day, do your best. And if you don't do it, don't beat yourself up. But get into the Word every day. Get into the pray every day. When you cultivate your relationship with Christ, Every other thing in your life gets in alignment. If you try to be a better husband, a better father, or whatever, a better employee, 
You try to do all these things. It's a hard thing to do. It's like, I can't do all this. But if you love God and learn to love God, everything else lines up. You will find you have more love for people. When I love God, I, I mean, there's been times I'm like, why am I, I care about these people. Why do I care about this person? This person's been a jerk to me. And it's like, I know why. It's because I've been loving God. This is beyond me. This is beyond my character. It's something supernatural that God has given me at times, love for people that I just frankly don't have my own. I mean, there's been times my wife and I, again, this is not, please don't take it as being patron or trying to pat ourselves on the back. But there's been times where some of you have been going through situations and we have suffered with it. As if we're going through it. And we're like, we're just grieved. I'm like, oh, I can't believe this is going. I'm really hurt for, for people. And it's hard. I'm like, God, why does this have to be so hard to love? It is hard. It's difficult to love people. It's hurtful. But you know what? That's what God's called us to do, to love people. To think about God first. And so, listen, the best thing you can do in your relationships, if you're married and you're and just Valentine's Day and all that, you can buy your wife flowers. You can buy him a brand-new car. You'll probably really appreciate all that. But the greatest thing you can do is learn to love God well and cultivate a relationship with God in love. This is why we have this time of worship, by the way. He loves me. If we would just get a hold of that, perfect love casts out fear. I want you to also, please, to um, turn to 1 John 4, 18. But I want to reiterate this. And this is why we're encouraging it in Bible small groups for it. Listen, I'm not interested in having church programs just so we can keep up with what's going on in our culture today. That's not important. Church programs are not important. What's important is to connect people together to learn how to love God and love each other well. That's what's really important. And, you know, I, I, this the other day I was praying to the Lord. I said, God, I love you. And I, I thought about it. And I started thinking, you know, God, even in my desire to love you more, it's self-centered because when I love God well, I feel like I'm complete. I'm like, God, I feel complete. when I, God, I guess I'm being self-centered because when I love you well, spend time in worship, I sense this. It's like everything fits. Everything resonates. It's like, ah, oh, this is what I'm created to do. And it's like, now I'm happy. And I'm think, thinking, God, am I doing this because I get happy because I'm with? And God said, hey, it's okay. I designed you to be happy. And that's okay. That's a reward for loving me. You feel complete. That's because that's the way it made you. It's not being selfish. But that's their benefit because I've designed you to have relationship with me. And when you have a relationship with me, you have joy unspeakable. You have joy that cannot be taken away. You have joy that's eternal. And my love is timeless. It's timeless. Let me, I mean... I'm going to ask you a quick question here. If you give your survey of your day, this is what I have found. I have found that if I get nothing else done during the day and I have time with God, I've had a good day. In fact, do a little test. I have found that when I have time with God and give him my day and I don't hang up the phone, I keep him in that prayer mode, I can't help but have a good day. No matter how bad it gets, I feel like I'm in the will of God. My friends, you and I are designed to be in God's will. And if you're going to try to find love in other relationships, it's going to be shallow. It's never going to be 100%. It may be passionate. It may, it may be a cotton candy experience. It may be wonderful. It may capture you. It may, and that's the thing about it. A lot of times passion is so overwhelming that it just is super. I remember being as a, as a young teenager, you know, just, oh, you get, you get lovesick. You can't do it. I mean, it's just, it's just, but that doesn't last. What really lasts is this agape love for God. And this is something I just think wonderful it says in 1 John chapter 4, if you could please turn there. And by the way, it's very interesting. John was the only disciple that was not martyred. They tried to kill him, and he just could not be killed. And what happened was he, they say the, the, uh, the fathers, apostolic fathers talk about him. And they would gather him together, and, and they'd say, I'm, I'm paraphrasing for the sake of paraphrasing. And they'd say, hey, John, tell us about the miracles. What happened? He says, love each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us about when Jesus raised the dead. Love each other. And he would talk about, are you loving each other? 
And that was his major theme constantly as he got older. Are you loving each other? Why? Because John got it. My friends, it's so important that we get it. First John chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 12. Actually, let's go before that, a little bit before that. Let's go to verse 7. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if you want to know love, you've got to know God. Everything else is a facsimile. There may be characteristics of love, but true love, unadulterated, 100% pure proof love, is found in God. Verse 9, and this, the love of God, when manifested to us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved, agape us, and sent his son to be the propitiation to take our place for us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Well, how do we cultivate love? I just told you how we cultivate love, is, is to have a love relationship with God in the proper context of cultivating it, of not just waiting for the emotions. There's going to be times where you're not going to have any emotion loving God. There's going to be times you read your Bible, it's dead. There's going to be times that even in your marriage, perhaps, you're just going through the motions, but you keep on doing the right thing. Why? Because love is a decision, not a feeling. Love is character. Love is strong. The most important and the most powerful thing. And listen, if you become the greatest healing evangelist, if you become the greatest pastor evangelist, and you're on the front of Time, Newsweek, Magazine, and you're on the Internet, and you're on all these blogs, and people talk about you and, and all that, no matter where you go, if you have not love, it means nothing. The most important thing that you and I can cultivate is love. The Bible says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians, First John 4, sorry, First, First John 4, 4, verse 12. No one has seen God any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been made perfect in us. By this we know we abide in him, and he is in us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit. And so he goes on to that. It also says, let's jump ahead to um, verse 18. There is no fear in love. You know, I, was, uh, I had a distinguished privilege to spend uh, about three weeks with Dr. Jack Hayford in California over the years. I and, uh, spent uh, one week at a time with 40 other pastors, and he told a story of a, of a child that was really going through difficult times. It, they went to psychologists, and they'd given him all the psychiatric, gave him shock treatments. They, he was a psychiatric mess. And, and basically, they realized there was some demonic activity. And they could not have victory over it. And what began to happen was this woman in the prayer team came over, and she just, just hugged him and says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, Jesus loves you. And he said it was the most amazing thing. As she showed the love, the demonic presence left the boy. Why? Because the love of God is so powerful. Listen, the Bible says perfect love cast out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he also loved God, must love his brother also. And that's an amazing concept. That if, if you don't love somebody else, in other words, if you hate someone who you do see, you cannot love God who you do not see. Which basically comes down to this. My relationship with God is mirrored in my relationship with other people. Jesus said something radical. He says, that if you help the poor, the downtrodden, 
If you give someone thirsty a cup of drink, you do it unto me. Jesus, when did we ever see you hungry? Jesus, when did we ever see you sick? When did we ever visit you in prison? He said, if you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. And here in, in 1 John it says, if you, if you love your brother, if you hate your brother whom you do see, you cannot love God who you do not see. So basically it's this. If you want to know how you're loving God, look at your relationships. If your relationships don't have love at every spectrum, if you're married, from your marriage uh, to your coworkers, to people, to your enemies, if, if you don't have love in you, then there's something wrong in your relationship. There's an area of that. And ask yourself the question, listen, even in wartime, even when if you're fighting the enemy, and I, and I talked to him about this. I talked to my uncle about this when he was fighting the Germans and he's shooting them down with a machine gun. I mean, that's, that's pretty, ooh, that's terrible. Yeah, I know, but it, it was, Nazi, Nazi was evil. And so it was love to kill, and I'm German, by the way, <laughs> okay? It was love to defeat the Germans. Why? Because of the evil of Hitler, because of his thing. You see, love protects. Now, after the war, it's different. It's hard to explain. But when you, you love somebody and you protect them, and so it's never right to hate anybody. We must love everyone, but sometimes love requires protection. Love might be a hard hand. Love might be going in and stopping, stopping in, in Rwanda and things of that nature or ethnic cleansing. When you go in there and you say, this is wrong, I have to protect this person. And you may have to take lives to save lives, but if it's done in love, there's a vast difference. So anytime you have hate in your heart, don't cultivate hate. Hate is a toxin that will basically take, rip a hole in your, in your love tank for God and it will eventually dry you out. True love loves God above all else. True love understands how much God has loved us that we forgive other people. So the Bible so clearly says this. It says in verse 20, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So Jesus gave his commandment, and also in John 15, 12, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You see, that's what Jesus did for us. Um, have you ever done, I mean, this is what, this is kind of interesting for me, okay? I, I, I thought about this. And if you're married or have kids, I mean, most men, most of us, if someone is going to, uh, you know, if someone's going to attack your children or something like that, you'll take a bullet for them. You know, you'll, you'll save somebody. And we'll do those heroic acts. But how come we don't do it every day? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'll die for you. You know, I'll die for you. But do we die daily for somebody? You see, that's true love. A heroic moment is important and it's nice and it's good. But Jesus said this, if you want to be my disciple, you must pick up your cross Daily and follow me. It means dying daily for Christ. My friends, when you and I die daily of ourselves, I'm, I'm trying to help you and, and remind you that you know, when you die to yourself, you can truly live. When you get rid of your selfish ambition, selfishness, and about me and me, I got to be happy. Listen, I is a horrible place to be. The island of I is an island of torture. You can never satisfy yourself if I is in the middle of your life. Only when you say it's not about me, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about God. When you put God first, when you love God first, let me tell you, it aligns everything else in your life and the greatest happiness you can have. You can have joy. And actually, we're starting a new series next week called, called um, Joy No Matter What. And how that we can have joy in our lives. And that comes through knowing Jesus Christ. So, as we celebrate Valentine's and we think about that, we think about who Valentine was and, and what it meant. He was a saint that laid down his life for somebody. There's a, the different things about that. And it's all about self-sacrifice. But what is it really all about? Conclusion is this. Unless you truly love God, and cultivate a love relationship with God. 
you will never be able to know real love in your relationships. So rather than me to give you a bunch of four steps to love your spouse, four sp steps to love your kids, four steps to love your parents, four steps to love your boss, your employees, and all that's great. There's nothing wrong with four or five steps or eight steps, whatever it is. But unless we get the first step right, everything else is temporary and will not work. Love God first. Love God first. What does that mean? That means that his way is higher than your way. And that happiness is not your quotin for life. God is your quotin for life. He is what we go after. My friends, until we do that, we'll never know love in its true context. Do you know what love is? Love is God. True love is God. Everything God does is in love. Even in his anger, he is love. Because he protects, hopes, heals, delivers. And Jesus is the greatest love you and I can ever experience. Let's bow our heads. Father, I want to thank you that you did not leave us as orphans. Lord, you didn't ask us to live a life we couldn't live. God, you sent Jesus to earth to come down to our level, to become one of us, to die for us, to put all of our guilt, all of our shame upon the cross. And you put your hands across from left to right. And this is how much you loved us. As far as the east is from the west, as your arms were on the cross, your arms extended as far as the east is from the west. Father, thank you for loving us when we were unlovely. Father, thank you for that. I just want to take you a few moments right now. For those of you that have given your lives to Christ, I want you to think about it. Think of how much he's forgiven you, how much he loves you. Let's just thank God right now. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for forgiving me, God. Thank you for forgiving me when I knew better and I still did the wrong thing. Thank you, Father, when I turned away from your Holy Spirit and said, I'm going to do it my way, God. Leave me alone for a little while. I'll get back to you later, God. And you still took me back. Father, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving us. Lord, you said so clearly, we cannot say we love you and hate our brother. Holy Spirit, search our hearts right now. If there's any hatred, don't have to be a prophet to say this, but I sense it. Some of you right now, so I can't forget my dad. You just can't forgive your father, your earthly father. You're saying, I don't want, that won't work for me. The reason why your marriage is not working out and the reason why you keep on bouncing around and you're having a hard time because you haven't forgiven your father. I just sense, I could be wrong, but I just sense, I think the Holy Spirit speaks to us as one of the gifts he gives us. And I just believe there's someone here today, at least one person, not here in line, but you haven't forgiven your dad. And your relationships are always screwed up. And your marriage and all that, it's just not working out. And the reason is you, ha you hate your dad. You've got to forgive your father. The Bible says you, have not, you hate your brother who you do see. So I want to encourage you right now. Anyone else here, if you have hatred towards anyone, maybe a past, an ex-spouse or a situation at work or, or something like that, you have hatred. So when you think of someone, you just, oh, I can't stand them. I wish they'd die. And you just had this horrible, this vexing feeling inside of you. And you just, it makes you cringe when you think of that person. It's time to let it go. Just right now, just the Holy Spirit, I just pray you just touch everyone here. Lord, reveal anything in our hearts right now. If there's any toxicity in our hearts right now. And let's take a moment right now and forgive that person. We're going to do it in faith. You do it in faith. You don't do it by feeling. You do it by actions. We make a decision, and our decisions make us. We make a decision, and then our decisions make us. So, Lord Jesus, right now, we think of those that have hurt us. 
Father, we think of those that have come against us, have caused us much pain and much discouragement, has caused us sleepless nights, has caused us anxiety and anger and difficulty. Father, these people we bring before you right now, and for that person that has a situation with their dad, is it just a young lady that's struggling with that? Some of, of us, we have issues right now with other people. Just think of those issues right now. Father, we, we just lay these people before you right now. Father, we're angry. We don't like these people. We don't like what they did to us. God, we're angry with them. We wish them harm and not good. But Father, and faith, not because of our feeling, but because of your word. We're choosing right now to love you first. Father, I forgive. I forgive. Maybe it's your ex-spouse. I forgive my ex-spouse. I forgive my mother. I forgive my father. Just right now, just tell the Lord right now, Lord, I forgive this person. Just say it. I forgive this person or these people right now. You need to say it. Yes, you do need to say it. You confess it with your mouth. You're saying, I know someone's saying, you know, I, that may be true, but I don't feel it. So what? So what? You don't feel it. It's time to us to say enough with the feeling stuff, okay? These feelings, they've been controlling you too long. That's enough, enough, enough. Enough of feelings. Faith is beyond feelings. So right now you need to say, Father, I forgive this person, though I don't feel it right now. I forgive this person because you forgave me. Right now, I forgive them. I let them, I give them to you, God. I give them to you, Jesus. I give these people to you right now. I ask you to forgive them, and I ask you to forgive me for holding resentment towards them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I forgive them in faith. I forgive them in faith. Thank you, Lord God, for forgiving me. I forgive them right now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, thank you. I have obeyed your word. I have forgiven this person with my mouth. Now, I ask you to heal my heart. Heal my emotions. And I will continue to let us up to you. Lord, I declare today that you are a boss. You are God, and I'm not. As we stay in an attitude of prayer, maybe some of you have been coming to church for a long time, and maybe some of you are watching it at home or wherever you're at right now. And and you've never really given your life to Jesus Christ. This, this does not work without Jesus. It does not work. It only works with Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. There's no way to God but through Him. There's no way to true love than without Jesus Christ. You have to have Christ. And He loves us. So what we need to do is, is lay your life down for Him right now. So I'm just going to pray a prayer in the quietness of your heart. If you want to or even repeat after me, if you want to repeat after me out loud. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. I give my life to you today. I declare I am no longer the boss. You are the boss. You are the master of my life. I lay my life down to you today. And I declare you are my God. God gave me the strength to constantly, daily, lay down my life to you. I choose to follow you from this day forward in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, is there anyone that prayed that prayer today for the first time or recommitted? Just quickly, just, show, just so I know how to pray better for you. Anyone else this morning? Just a quick show of hands. Anyone this morning say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I really mean business with God today. Anyone here this morning? Okay, I see that. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. Let's just conclude with prayer. Father, today we choose to love as you've loved us. Thank you that you are a good God, a loving God. We thank you today. Lord, I ask that you would baptize everyone here with your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand if we could. Maybe we can just sing that one chorus. Can we sing that chorus? He loves me. G I can't hear the can't hear the key. <laughs> Jesus, he loves me. He loves me. He is for me. Jesus.
Jesus, how can it be? He loves me. He is for me. One more time. Jesus, He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. Jesus, how can it be? He loves me. He is for One more time. Jesus, He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. Jesus, how can it be? He loves me. He is for me. Amen. But the Lord bless you, may keep you. May His warmth and His grace surround you. Let us walk in His love and His grace. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, everybody. God bless you. Love to see you at 301 today at 1245 if you haven't come.